Uh, thank you, Giovanni, and I guess uh, thanks to all the organizers for putting together this sort of uh, virtual version of, uh, of this workshop. So uh, glad this is working out. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, SCDM, which we call a unified approach to linear localization. And before I dive into that, just wanna mention that this is joint work, uh, primarily with Lin Lin and Le Xing Ying um, for the development of the SCDM methods. And then one or two plots I'll have towards the end. Um, we have some work with Antoine Levet on uh, sort of some modifications to uh, optimization procedures that fit nicely with the SCDM procedure, but I'm not gonna talk about those uh, today. There's a reference at the end or I'm happy to offline. And funding at various points for this has been generously provided by the NSF uh, Simons Foundation and DOE. Okay. So uh, the, the goal for today's talk, or the, the sort of uh, thrust of today's talk, is to talk about the so-called selected columns of the density matrix procedure. And the viewpoint I'm going to take to this talk is to talk about it as a so-called direct method for computing maximally localized linear functions. So it is, in some sense, a non-iterative procedure you can use to compute localized basis functions. However, more generally, one can think of it as a robust and automated initialization for an optimization-based approach. So depending on what you're doing, it might make sense to say, okay, here's a simple procedure that you can always use to construct an initial guess and then run the optimization procedure to get to a local minimum. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll highlight that makes it particularly nice in this case is that it has relatively few parameter choices you have to make in order to build this initial guess. So it really is sort of highly automated. In a sense, it tries to take advantage directly of the underlying physics to say, here's how we can get uh, good localized basis functions. First, I'm going to discuss the, the isolated case just to sort of talk about what SCDM does and lay out some details. And then I'll move on to talking about the uh, so-called entangled case. So where that's where there's some more parameters and you have to to do sort of a, a disentanglement and localization procedure all in one. Okay, so given the uh, nature of this workshop, I kind of omitted uh, many of the slides I often have up front um, talking about or laid out kind of the, the physics context we're in. So I more commonly give this talk to sort of applied mathematicians. Um, but I did want to have one slide on sort of condensed notation for this talk just to get everybody uh, sort of on the same page with the way I'm gonna to talk about things. So for the purpose of today, uh, or for the purpose of this talk, um, we're gonna have a self-joint Hamiltonian operator H, nonlinear one in this case, but the eigenfunctions of this, I'm gonna call psi. So the psi i's in the upper left are the eigenfunctions and the lambda i's are the eigenvalues. And what we're gonna be interested in are the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of H that live in some interval J, or sorry, I. So this interval for the moment, I'm gonna assume has gaps on both sides of it. Um, so there's a picture in the upper right, we'll think of I as some interval of the real line where the eigenvalues we care about live. The localization problem or the way I'm gonna to, to talk about it and the kind of simplified uh, uh, setting we're gonna be in is that I want to find, or we want to find a minimal set of orthonormal localized functions, linear functions, such that their span is within the span of psi. So the fees are going to be the localized functions. And we may have fewer of them uh, than we have size. And that's going to be in the entangled case. So on the right, we see we have some interval of eigenvalues we care about. We have the eigenfunction psi. That's going to be the starting point for everything I talk about is just having those. And we want to construct a localized basis set of nw uh, linear functions where nw could be less than or equal, or is definitely less than or equal to n. For the first part of this talk, it'll be equal to n, the number of eigenfunctions in that interval. Okay, little more notation uh, for this talk, um, just to kind of fits with everything else I think that's been, been going on. I'm going to consider the domain in R to be discretized over ng uniform grid points. This will just come into play when I talk a little bit about the computational complexity of the SCDM method. So ng is the number of grid points or discretization points of these eigenfunctions. Um, and then I'm gonna overload psi and phi to also be now vectors of length ng. So I'm gonna be working primarily with two matrices. One is capital psi, which is just psi one through psi n stacked as vectors. So it's an ng by n matrix. 
N phi, which is an NG by NW matrix. So that's the matrix of localized basis functions. It could have fewer columns than psi uh, in the entangled setting. Okay, so we're now gonna talk about uh, what the SCDM methodology is and what the algorithm is that builds uh, this automated initial guess for localized basis functions. Uh, the way I think about it is that there's some nice and interesting linear algebra kind of sitting under the hood of this problem. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the uh, isolated case. So in this setting, nw, the number of linear functions we want is equal to n, the number of eigenfunctions we start with. And we're assuming that the eigenvalues of interest or the, the part of the spectrum of interest is gapped from the rest of the spectrum. And we'll come back to talking about what we do when there's uh, no gaps in, in a little bit. But for now, I have an isolated part of the spectrum I'm interested in. And notationally, I'm gonna call P, which is the outer product psi psi star or the orthogonal projector onto the subspace spanned by the eigenfunctions is the density matrix. So uh, density matrix in this context, uh, orthogonal projector, just thinking about it from a, a linear algebra point of view. And I have a little picture on the right for a very simple 1D example that says, um, in the very simple 1D model problem, if you have uh, this simple periodic potential, you get a density matrix that sort of reflects that. I'll talk about that a lot more uh, later on. All right, but the key observation here and kind of the, the crux of, of how SCDM works is by leveraging the observation that for insulating systems, this density matrix, psi psi star, has well localized columns. So, um, sorry, I do see one question in the chat. So I am gonna come back to sort of uh, K-point sampling and dependence there later in the talk. So for now, just think of a, a sort of gamma point only calculation for simplicity. Um, so for insulating systems, this density matrix, psi psi star has well localized columns. So in fact, they decay exponentially. So this has been known uh, for a while. Um, there's a nice, at least in the discrete setting review paper by Benzi, Boito, and Rizuk in 2013 uh, that discusses this from a very linear algebraic point of view. But the key point or the key observation this gives us is if I take this matrix, psi, psi star, every column of psi, or sorry, every column of P is a localized vector in the range of psi. So I can actually find localized functions in the range of psi just by looking at columns of P. So we're actually gonna use columns of P to construct our localized basis and say, okay, what are we trying to do when we build localized functions? We're trying to find localized, orthonormal localized basis functions in the range of psi. The matrix P tells us or gives us localized functions. They're just not orthonormal yet. So we're gonna to have to fix that later on but I can just take columns of the density matrix and I get a localized basis in some sense. The question is which columns should we select? In principle, if I take any linearly independent set of columns of P, I get a local basis that's non-orthogonal. However, if the conditioning of those columns is bad, if they overlap a lot, when I go to orthogonalize them, I could run into problems. So this raises the question, the matrix P has NG columns, and I only need n local basis functions. So which columns should I select from this matrix? Okay, and I'm gonna kind of illustrate the procedure for doing that with the simple 1D example from early. So here I have an example density matrix for a 1D model problem, just for illustration, uh, that arises from this simple potential. And the observation is, okay, if I pick any, sorry, that should be n, not n e, if I pick any n linearly independent columns, in, in principle, I have a local basis that spans the same space. But there are poor choices. For example, if I pick these eight columns, I get a lot of local basis functions, but many of them look very, very similar to each other. So when I go to orthogonalize them, I could destroy this locality. However, if I make a good selection of columns, if I pick a set of columns that don't overlap much and are mutually well conditioned, then I get local basis functions that look like this for this 1D problem. And when I go and orthogonalize these, I'm not gonna affect 
the locality much. That's a statement that can be made a little more uh, formal. I'm not going to, to here, but we can actually say, okay, once, if you start with something that's near orthogonal or orthonormal, when you do the orthonormalization procedure, things don't change too much. So the key idea or, or takeaway I, I want to get up here is as long as we pick a good set of columns from the spectral projector, from the density matrix, we have a pretty good starting point for a local basis. Okay. All right. And that's actually the sort of only key insight in constructing the SCDM algorithm. Once you have that, we could actually write down the algorithm in sort of three or four simple, simple steps. So the first is, and I'll talk about it more in a second, we use a common matrix factorization, a so-called column pivoted QR factorization, though there are others you could use, um, to figure out what the right set of columns of this matrix P are. And the way we do that is we take the matrix size, so this is the NG by N matrix, look at its conjugate transpose, and compute a column pivoted QR factorization of it. This gives me a permutation matrix pi, an orthogonal matrix Q, an upper triangular matrix R1, and a dense matrix R2. And if I look at this permutation matrix pi, I can look at, okay, it's a permutation over NG things. I look at the first NW things it selects, the first NW things in that permutation. So that could be columns 6, 27, 398, whatever. I get what are the first NW columns. And I say, those are the columns of P I'm going to use to build my local basis. Okay. Once you have those, in the next step, you simply take those columns of the local or of the density matrix and solve, and I'll, I'll come back to what this connects to in different language in a second, solve what I think of as an orthogonal Procustes problem. I say, I have templates for local basis functions, which are these columns of P, but they're not orthogonal. So I solve the minimization problem, take the eigenfunctions I start with and make them look as much like the templates as possible while still maintaining orthonormality. So this minimization over Q says, look over orthogonal matrix Q, orthogonal matrices Q, and rotate psi to look as much like the columns of the density matrix you picked as possible. By constraining Q to be an orthogonal matrix, we can't lose orthonormality. So this is actually equivalent to load and orthogonalization, um, just written a little differently. And therefore you can compute this matrix Q just by taking an SVD of a subset of columns of psi star. Um, so I see another question on picking the columns to start with. Uh, I'll talk about this pivoted QR in a second and how that does that. So it's not an iterative procedure. It's actually a greedy sort of one shot procedure. Um, okay, once you have this matrix Q, then phi equals psi Q is your local basis. So I have a sort of example of this algorithm in action on the right, where I've colored in entries of these matrices based on them being big enough. And we can see that we go from a relatively dense matrix to a sparse one after truncation. And one column of psi Q here is actually this local basis function uh, that I've, I've pictured on the right. Okay. So the crux of this algorithm then is seemingly how I pick this set C. And we do this with what's known as a column pivoted QR factorization. A column pivoted QR factorization is part of a more general class of so-called rank revealing QR factorizations. And I think one of the, the simplest ways to think about it is the following, that the ideal problem we would like to solve is to take this matrix P, which has NG columns, and pick the subset of N columns that has the smallest condition number. So if I look at every possible subset of N columns and check its condition number of that N G by N matrix, which one is smallest? Unfortunately, uh, this so-called best column subset selection problem is provably hard. So uh, dating as far back as the 1960s and with a bit of a resurgence in the 1990s, there was a lot of an effort to build approximation algorithms for this, to say, okay, here's a direct algorithm that you can use that gets you a pretty good subset or gets you pretty good conditioned set of columns. 
Uh, there's whole class of these. They're known as rank revealing QR factorizations. The column pivoted QR factorizations, the first one, um, to, going back to a paper by Golub and Bussinger in 1965. And uh, that's also the one that's implemented in LAPAC. So it's really easy to, to use or call in a software package. Okay, so what this column pivoted QR process does is it says, take this matrix P, say, and compute a permutation pi such that the QR factorization of P times pi keeps this upper triangular matrix R1 as well conditioned as possible. Okay. And so that's where it's trying to say, I'm going to pick this permutation so that the columns are well conditioned. It just can't be optimal about it, but it can still do a good job. The key thing here is that applying this algorithm to psi star instead of P gives you the same result. So you don't actually ever have to build this, you know, the actual density matrix. You can just apply this pivoted QR to the short wide matrix. And it's deterministic in runtime. It has a complexity of n squared times ng. So it's linear in the grid size and quadratic in uh, the number of functions you have. So it's relatively efficient. We do have some work on, you know, if, N is, if NG is very large, there are some things you can do to accelerate this further. Um, I'm not going to talk about that here. But so uh, I guess to, to come back and answer the question, there's no need to pick a sort of starting point. Uh, this is just a, a one shot QR factorization like algorithm with a permutation thrown in. And the permutation is actually picked greedily along the way. Okay. So with that in mind, I just want to give a slightly sort of alternative perspective on the algorithm uh, I wrote down earlier with some commentary on the right. And so the way I think, uh, way I like to think about this algorithm is that, uh, so we have this first step, the QR factorization, and that simply is our way of saying, give me a well-conditioned set of columns of the density matrix P. Conceivably, there's other ways one could get at this. It's not that a rank revealing QR is the only way one can do this. But this we found to be a very effective way to say, find a well-conditioned subset of columns of P. Then we simply apply load and orthogonalization to say, take these columns and orthonormalize them. So we think of these columns as templates for localized functions. And then we just make our orthonormal basis look as much like that as possible. And that's how we get to a local basis. Okay. So just a, a quick sort of uh, show of what results for this look like before I, I jump into the entangled case and then how this works when you have multiple K points. Um, Sorry, yeah. So well-conditioned means they are as close to orthonormal as possible. So I'm actually looking at ratios of the first and last singular value uh, for this submatrix. So if the matrix had orthonormal columns, the condition number would be one. Um, in general, like for many of the problems we look at, you get things with condition numbers in the single digits, maybe in the tens after this procedure. So you do get stuff pretty close to, to orthogonal. Okay, so, so here's an example uh, for this uh, uh, simple molecule, CR203, where what we did is say, okay, let's try several different guesses into uh, one year 90 to try to find localized one year functions. And let's look at the spread as a function of iteration. And so in the blue line, we have the initial guess constructed by SCDM. And then in the red and, and black dotted line, we just have a couple other choices uh, we made. I'm not saying these are the best choices one could write down by hand, but just to, to see that you can see very different behavior depending on the initial guess. And we can see that, okay, so for one of the initial guesses, which was quite poor, the SP2 orbitals, you actually converge to a different local minima than where SCDM and the, the DXDY or the D-type orbitals gets. And then even for the, the D-type orbitals, it, you have to go about 25 iterations before you get to spread that's as uh, small as where SCDM is. And uh, SCDM, I guess we plotted it on this scale just to show the difference at the start. Uh, SCDM does improve because Whittier 90 can only improve the spread. But as you can see here, it doesn't change much. And we'll see that a little during the, the tutorial as well. Okay, so now the question is, what happens if this set of eigenvalues you care about is not isolated? So what if now, as we have in the upper right, the, the set of the spectrum I you care about 
is not gapped uh, from the rest of, of the orbitals. Um, so I think I'll be, I might come back to the natural orbital uh, question either at the end or, or afterwards. I can say a little bit more about that, um, but not, uh, yeah, I'll, I can say a little more about that. There are some differences and some connections that I now understand more about uh, with some recent work. So let's say I take I, this interval um, of the line that's not gapped from the rest. Well, then if I just looked at the spectral projector P onto the first N eigenfunctions, the ones with eigenvalues in I, it doesn't decay nicely uh, because I don't have this gap. However, so I actually have this, sorry, plotted on the right where if I take uh, this sort of model problem without a gap and I just look at the density matrix, you see some decay, but then it rings a lot. Like it doesn't actually get small. So what we do instead is say, well, we can force decay by using a so-called quasi-density matrix. So if I take any smooth function F and apply it to the eigenvalues, I can force rapid decay in this quasi-density matrix. So in particular here, for any smooth function F, if I look at this fun, uh, matrix P hat, it decays rapidly away from the diagonal. Okay? And we're gonna use that to build a SCDM procedure for the so-called entangled case. And the, the sort of crux of the idea is the density matrix doesn't have the decay we want, so we force it to by using a quasi-density matrix. And we just put that decay in there. And we're now gonna be in the setting typically where we want NW localized functions and we start with N eigenfunctions. So um, just here, think of NW as less than N. Okay, so then the question is, how do you pick these functions uh, F? So the first case we've already looked at on the left, which is the isolated case. And we can see here that we have sort of isolated eigenvalues on the left, and that means we can kind of pick F to be the step function or a smooth approximation of it, and we still get a local density matrix, all right? So in some sense, you could think of F as highlighting the eigenvalues of interest or the bands of interest. We then have what we call uh, two entangled cases. Um, so uh, to answer the question, so the SCDM are localized. It does not solve any kind of optimization problem. So they are not guaranteed to be like at a stationary point of an optimization problem. They're localized and they tend to be very good than when you subsequently optimize them, but they're not formally set up to solve any kind of optimization problem. So they're not maximally localized in any sense like that. Um, so that's why running like, uh, when you're afterwards, you can clean them up in some sense and get to a local minimum. Um, okay, so, so the other two cases we're, we're interested in are when you're interested in the bottom part of the spectrum. So here I is say everything less than some value mu C. And then we pick this F to be a complementary error function to say, okay, we're gonna keep all the eigenvalues in the interval of interest and then smoothly decay and sort of taper the contribution of the eigenvalues as we no longer want them. So that's what this complementary error function does is if we care about all the eigenvalues from minus infinity to some value, we can pick I this way as this complementary error function. If I'm interested in a sort of interior set of the spectrum, then we pick this F to be a Gaussian and say, okay, if I'm interested in eigenvalues in some interval, mu C plus minus sigma, I can pick F as a Gaussian that sort of highlights this part of the spectrum. It's big on stuff near the center of I and tapers off. Um, I will say in the isolated case, uh, you might have noticed there were basically no parameters to pick. The only input to the algorithm was psi. Now we do have two parameters, which is mu C and sigma, right? So these functions are not universal in the sense that I have to define these two parameters to make them effective. So we always use a complementary error function or a Gaussian, but you have to center them and taper them in, in kind of a reasonable way for this to work out. So there are now some parameters to pick. Okay, but the key is we use F to highlight the eigenvalues of interest in our problem. Okay, so uh, it turns out though that once you do this, you can actually 
kind of just run with the SCDM procedure as before with very minor changes. So I'm now gonna let lambda, capital lambda, be the matrix that has the eigenvalues on the diagonal. And formally, uh, we're gonna throw away eigenvalues where f of lambda is sufficiently small. This is just so that when I write this, I'm not technically writing a ng by ng problem. It's still small. So the complementary error function and the Gaussian, at some point, they're small enough, you're ignoring things. And now, instead of computing a rank revealing QR factorization or column pivoted QR factorization of psi star, the short wide matrix, we weight the rows by f of their respective eigenvalue. So what you're doing is saying, okay, if I have an eigenfunction and its eigenvalue is such that f of lambda is one, then I leave that row of psi star alone. But if I have a row of psi star that is small, or sorry, a row of psi star where the eigenvalue f of lambda is small, I downweight that row and I sort of shrink it by whatever this function is applied to the eigenvalue. So f of lambda applied from the left is a row scaling of psi star. However, now, once you do this, you can just treat it like before and say, I'm going to take the first nw columns selected by this permutation and use those as templates for local basis functions. The only difference is now these templates of local basis functions come not from the density matrix, but the quasi-density matrix. So if you look at this, uh, load orthogonalization or orthogonal Procustes problem, we now make psi subject to a subunitary matrix Q. So Q is now taller than it is wide. It's N by NW. We say psi times Q, we want to look as much like the columns of this quasi-density matrix as possible. And the quasi-density matrix is well localized um, because we forced it to be. So those functions on the right have to be well localized that we're making psi look like. So on the right, I have the, uh, this, this sort of written another way, which is, okay, we compute a QR factorization of P hat effectively. We never build P hat. We can do it just by looking at psi star or F of lambda times psi star. By doing that QR factorization, we identify both a subspace of dimension NW and NW localized vectors within it. So we're sort of simultaneously figuring out what the subspace we want to use is for localization and the local vectors in it. We then solve the orthogonal Procustes problem to align psi with those templates for basis functions. So I like to say this kind of simultaneously finds the subspace and localized basis if you think of it in a disentanglement uh, perspective. Okay, so uh, I think, yeah, so okay, we're doing good on time. So. I now just want to talk about what happens uh, when we're thinking of this in, in the study with k-point sampling. Uh, I'll lay out a little notation uh, early on. So most of you, I believe, will be familiar with this, but just so that uh, you have the kind of notation I'm going to use and so on. Uh, th the nice thing is, you'll see once I get there, basically nothing changes for this case with SCDM. Uh, we just have to pick the columns from a single k-point and then solve a, a orthogonalization problem once for every k-point. So uh, it's not going to be significantly more complicated. It actually ends up being quite, quite nice. Um, so now we're in the setting where VR is, is periodic. On, I draw in everything on just kind of a 1D lattice for uh, what I've given this, this talk or, or some of these slides uh, before for something that, you know, 1D is a little easier to see. So we have some periodic atomic structure and we're going to have the uh, Ramos lattice L unit cell gamma. So the lattice vectors here are the A's. Here I've written this just with A1, but uh, later on the notation will be that it's A1, A2, A3. We then have the reciprocal lattice, which I'll call L star, the way I think of it as a Fourier counterpart of L, and its unit cell, which is the, the uh, first Borrelian zone, gamma star. Okay. Um, the, then using the sort of uh, block floquet, theory, we could say, okay, this means I can relabel the spectrum of my of H via two indices, a Brillian zone index K and a band index B. So a key piece of notation here is just this little B is what I'm using for the band index. Um, and then K as usual is the, the Brillian zone index. So schematically, right, we have this on the right where we have K 
in some sense laid out, and I now have different eigenvalues for different k that get sort of spread out over this. Um, the other key piece is that I'm going to call the black orbitals psi, where u sub bk is their periodic uh, counterpart on L. So uh, the key point now is just the two sub indices on psi. This will be important later on for when I write this algorithm down. Okay, so in this setting, we want a basis that I now call W of B and, and capital R that is spatially localized. And we're going to do this by constructing an alternative basis for psi that we'll call psi tilde. So this is where we're now computing a k dependent gauge that says for every k point, I need to go from psi k, which is the block functions uh, at that k point, to psi tilde of k. And we simultaneously want to identify a subspace of the localized basis like before. So everything I say here will be both for the isolated and entangled case, uh, just like before. Okay. Once you have this sort of uh, alternative basis for psi, psi tilde, then the Wenier functions come from a, a Fourier transform. And I'll just say that uh, this sort of good basis for this only exists for certain classes of H. So for example, the things I'm talking about here, we know don't work for like topological insulators. Um, I can say a little bit about why later on if people are, are curious, but the uh, K dependent density matrices for topological insulators have some interesting, interesting structure. Okay. The other key observation is that if I compute these localized functions for the zero point or so-called gamma point, then I, or sorry, for, the, for R zero, sorry, uh, then I can, compute them for all other capital R just by translates. So we only kind of have to do this once, okay? So the thing is now our perspective on how we pick psi tilde changes just a little bit. And the reason is that if I pick these functions psi tilde BK such that they're analytic in K, because I get the Wenier functions from a Fourier transform, analytic functions of psi tilde are analytic in K, then the Wittier function, the WBR, will be localized uh, because of, of properties of the Fourier transform. So what we're trying to do here, which is a little different conceptually than earlier, that we'll see that the same algorithm ends up working, is I'm trying to pick a gauge so that these functions psi tilde are smooth with respect to K. And the important observation is the following, which is if I look at K dependent density matrices, so this is a little bit of an abusive notation, but if I say I have a density matrix for each K constructed from its block functions, so only the ones that have the right subscript sub K and bands in the correct interval, then in the isolated case, so for the moment I'm assuming an isolated system, so NW equals N, this K, the entries of this K dependent density matrix are both gauge invariant because I have the outer product of psi psi star and they're analytic with respect to K. This means that if I pick a fixed set, a fixed set in K of columns of PK, I get analytic functions in K because the columns of this, these K dependent density matrices, the entries of those are analytic. So that's actually the condition we want now is to say, as long as I pick a consistent set of columns to use as my template localized functions, I'll get this nice analytic behavior in K. I have the additional constraint, like before, that I want them to be well conditioned. So when I do the orthogonalization, I don't change them much. Okay, so uh, this is just to, to practically say from a notation standpoint that gamma star gets discretized, and I'm going to call that set script k. And I'm going to think of nk as the number of k points we have. Also, I'm going to call k naught, or that's the notation I'm going to use for the gamma point, because that'll be important in, in just a second. OK, so now let's look at SCDM for the isolated uh, case algorithmically for this problem. So you might notice the first step of this algorithm actually changes minimally. All it says is look at the gamma point and compute this column pivoted QR like before. So psi star K naught is a, a number of eigenfunctions by number of grid in the unit cell matrix. And I simply pick 
uh, n columns of this matrix. I use this same procedure, say, I get a permutation over ng things, take the first n of them. And that's the set script C, which gives me my templated templates for localized basis functions. The key point here is I only do this at the gamma point. So that's important because I want to pick the same columns for every k. If I was changing the set of columns I picked for every k, I wouldn't have this nice analytic property of the density matrices to take advantage of, okay? Um, we did look a little bit at ways to pick this by using slightly bigger cells than just the gamma point. Uh, we saw really no difference. So for the moment, we kind of stick with just using the gamma point for this. Uh, conceivably, there's some specific problems where uh, one has to be a bit more careful, okay? Once you pick this set of columns, then we simply go through the same procedure as before to do this orthogonalization. It's just that we have to do it once for every k. So the set of columns stays the same across k, but the orthogonal matrix Q, the gauge, changes for every k. But these problems are now completely independent. You could solve them in parallel. They're small uh, load and orthogonalization problems, so it's not particularly expensive here. I then have a set of gauges QK that gives me a set of smooth psi tilde functions. So I now have these localized basis functions I want. Okay, so when we're in the entangled case, um, nothing particularly changes from the uh, sort of non-K non point sampling setting. It's just the isolation condition now has to hold across K and we still use quasi-density matrices. It's just now we have K-dependent quasi-density matrices. So for every K, I should have, uh, this should have like a hat on the P, uh, my apologies, because this is a quasi-density matrix that's a function of K. Now we don't have uh, sort of any theoretical results on how smooth this is in K. Numerically, we do observe that it's smooth as a function of K. So. Uh, I think I, I had the references at the bottom, but forgot to mention earlier. For the isolated case, uh, you could actually say, and, and people have said some rigorous things about this, for the quasi-density matrices, we don't quite have that. Okay, but now the SCDM algorithm for the entangled case looks the same as before, where the modification is now um, that, at, oops, ah, my apologies. So the QRCP, and I should uh, fix these slides, is only computed at the gamma point as before. So that should be K naught in, uh, in this line here um, because I only compute this at the gamma point as before. So it's the same modification uh, as before. I just weight by this function F of the eigenvalues. We use the same functions, either a complementary error function or a Gaussian function, depending on whether you want the first part of the spectrum or an interior set. And then we simply solve for each K this orthogonalization problem. So we get a K dependent gauge. In order for this to do a good job, we need that the singular values of this F of lambda K psi star K restricted to this subset of columns are uniformly bounded away from zero. This is actually what breaks down for things like topological insulators. It turns out that if there's no subset of columns of PK or, or like, even without the f of lambda there, that are uh, that are, have singular values uniformly bounded away from zero. So, like every column vanishes somewhere in the Borelian zone. So, there's some some interesting structure. Okay, so just to kind of recap this before I show a few results. Uh, so, as I frame this here, this is a direct method. So, this method doesn't require its own initial guess. It's best thought of as an initial guess for other methods. So, you can run this without having to, to pick any parameters except for mu c and sigma. And it's also computationally efficient uh, with respect to k-point sampling because the QRCP, which is the most expensive part of this, is only done once. So the QRCP, as I mentioned, scales linearly in the grid size, in NG, or the unit cell grid size, in, in this setting, uh, and quadratically in the number of eigenfunctions. All of the Procustes problems, all of the load and orthogonalizations are just cubic in the number of eigenfunctions. So they're like n squared instead of ng, or sorry, n cubed instead of ng. Um, so really the QRCP is the most expensive part and that only has to be done once. Um, in, there are also parallel implementations of column pivoted QR factorizations and so on that could be leveraged if, if necessary. 
there's only two parameters to pick here, uh, mu c and sigma, which help you denote the region of interest. I guess the setting you're in is also a third parameter, which is, are you in the isolated case, the sort of first entangled case where you're using a complementary error function or the second entangled case where you're using a Gaussian. Um, and in some sense, uh, the way we've cooked this up, we're combining the two disentanglement uh, steps of Susan Mazzari and Vanderbilt, and we're accomplishing those somewhat simultaneously. So um, that's not like to say that it's the same as that procedure, but just as a sort of conceptual thing, uh, we're doing this. So there's a question on that. If you don't need an initial guess, how do you determine the number of linear functions? Right. So, so the way I think about this is in the isolated case, um, I'm picking that, uh, so in the isolated case, I always have the same number of linear functions and eigenfunctions I want. Um, in the, uh, I, I guess there's two ways to think about this here. Uh, in the entangled case, either that is an additional parameter where you say NW, like you know ahead of time the number of linear functions you want, or uh, though we don't uh, do this in, in practice because it gets a bit tricky in, in the implementation of linear 90 doesn't do this, you can actually look at entries of the column of the upper triangular matrix in the column pivoted QR. Those will monotonically decay in magnitude. And you can set a threshold for once stuff is small enough, you should probably stop for certain reasons. Um, that's a bit more heuristic. So actually at the moment, that is like a third parameter, which is number of linear functions. And then uh, again, the, we don't have to try all combinations of columns because the QR, the QR factorization does this for us. So that's a, that's a deterministic, like you can just write down the algorithm um, matrix factorization that gives you back a good set of columns. So if I wanted to solve the subset selection problem, actually find the best conditioned one, I would have to look at all subsets and that would be prohibitively expensive. That would be exponential time. So we use these approximation algorithms instead and say, we can get maybe not the best possible conditioned subset, but a very well conditioned subset at much lower cost, cost that is linear in NG and quadratic in the number of eigenfunctions. So we go that route instead and it performs very well in practice. Um, and uh, the other question is, does the grid have to be uniform? It actually does not, um, but you do have to be a little bit careful then about factoring in the integration weights and stuff so that things are or orthonormal in the right sense. Um, but the grid actually does not have to be uh, uniform. In fact, uh, the way we accelerate this algorithm for if NG is very big is we first build an appropriate de probability density function to subsample columns. So we actually only compute a QR factorization on a subset of grid points. And we have a fast way to go from a big grid to a smaller grid uh, based on random sampling. So we can prove some things about with high probability results, we get a very close result to as if we looked at everything. And that's in some sense using like a non-uniform grid. Um, and yet there are other, so we use grid points. There are ways you could think about picking things deterministically. We've tried a few. We've yet to find one that's as robust as uh, actually just letting the condition, like actually trying to sort of take advantage of the information in the density matrix. Um, because this procedure is not iterative, we can't really use an initial, initial guess. Uh, for this. So, and then um, the, to the other question about atom-centered linear functions. So it actually will, so it gets, uh, what's the way to say this? It's not necessary that they're atom-centered. If you do things, so, so I'm currently involved in some work where we've translated all of this to, to work nicely in atomic orbital bases instead of plane waves. And there you can say some interesting things, but SCDM will pick up in many cases, the same uh, like either bond centered or, or other functions you would expect to get with uh, maximally localized linear functions uh, with say bond centered guesses with linear numbers. So they are not necessarily atom centered. A key thing to keep in mind that's kind of plausibly counterintuitive is that the grid points SCDM picks because columns of the density matrix P correspond to grid points. The grid points SCDM picks don't necessarily correspond to the centers of the local functions. They're grid points, but that doesn't mean the centers of the final local basis are at those grid points. What I'm actually doing is projecting a, a Dirac distribution that's centered at that point, but that can actually give me a bond centered function. So it can go either way depending on the 
the atomic structure. Okay, so I just want to show a few quick numerical examples. And then I'll um, maybe hold off on the last bit for the tutorial uh, where I talk about how this is, is now in Winnier 90. So these numerical examples were done using Quantum Espresso and uh, Winnier 90. After we made these examples and wrote this paper, uh, SCDM is now in Winnier 90, part of the reason I'm, I'm talking here today. Uh, this GitHub repository has our earth that did so I still like mentioned. So I put my, my little slides, I only answered some questions and things. It was really the Winnier 90 developer team that took this and the Valero in particular, I think, and ran with getting this into, into Winnier 90. So we're, we're very excited about that and, and would like to thank them for that. Um, okay, so, so first uh, we look at doing a uh, band structure interpolation uh, for graphing. So this is on a 12 by 12 by 1 k-port grid. And we have a reference calculation in red. And then we use SCDM to get uh, localized functions and then do band structure interpolation with those. And this plot, actually, we didn't do any optimization after the fact. This is just SCDM with no, no optimization afterwards. So just whatever comes out of this column pivoted QR and, and orthogonalization algorithm. And we can see that we actually, uh, the blue dots are this interpolant get very good uh, results just with SCDM by itself without any, any subsequent optimization. So we're already getting to kind of a good place without doing anything else. And then we hope that we can only improve it with subsequent optimization. Um, same thing holds. So this is now an example for silicon where we're in the entangled case one. So we've used a complementary error function to get the first four bands. And then, uh, so this is for valence and conduction bands. And now we have two, uh, two lines to look at. The reference calculation is in black. SCDM by itself is in blue. And when near 90 with the disentanglement procedure, taking the SCDM initial guess and optimizing it is in red. So we can see that for the, the first four bands, you basically don't see a difference between the two. You do start to see a difference as you get to the top of the, the window you care about. So as you move towards the area you're not expected to do a good job with interpolation, you start to see some differences between the raw output from SCDM and what you get after uh, running Winnier 90 on that or letting Winnier 90 disentangle and optimize post uh, SCDM. Okay, uh, last example. So this is just, sorry. Uh, here we have uh, the first entangled case. So this used a complementary error function. I also wanna show one case where we use a Gaussian function. So this is for uh, conduction bands of copper. Uh, the dotted lines or the, the sort of frozen energy window um, from, from when you're 90. And then here we again have the SCDM interpolant by itself in blue and the optimized version in red. And as you can see, especially it's sort of the, the, if you stay away from the edges of the frozen window, you really see comparable behavior between SCDM and the further optimized uh, spread. Um, it's really as you get to the edges of the window that you start to see there's some differences uh, between this band interpolation. Okay, uh, last thing to look at and then I'll, I'll uh, wrap it up is that we also just wanted to look at to see the convergence in the interpolation quality as a function of k points because this is where we expect to see the locality uh, really come into play in, in straight lines on this plot if we're getting good localization. So we looked at this for uh, isolated or for uh, valence bands of silicon and also uh, aluminum, so a metal where we can't really say as much theoretically. And we can see that, so in the, the silicon, the band structure interpolation um, behaves very, very similarly between SCDM and then it gets a little better if you optimize it after the fact. Uh, the green circles, which I didn't talk about, are this uh, slight variant of the optimization procedure that uh, uh, Lynn and I worked on with uh, Antoine. And then for a little bit of you see something similar, which is they behave very similarly. You do get a slight improvement in this uh, root mean squared error by looking, by doing some optimization after the fact. Okay, so um, I think I will actually stop, uh, stop there because I'll show this during the tutorial. So I have a, a slide on kind of how this is used in when you're 90. I'll hold off and talk about that at the start of the tutorial so it's fresh in everybody's mind. I did just want to say thank you to uh, Valero and all the when you're 90 developers for uh, really getting this integrated and uh, making it easy, very easy to use. I'll hide that and just say for, for questions. So uh, the references for this talk uh, are on this slide. You can find them all on my website. 
um, along with more information if, if you're curious about this. Um, and I guess I will stop now and take questions uh, before uh, Giovanni's talk. So thank you. <laughs>